Hey, so if you're like me, you're probably brand new to making a podcast and probably have no clue where to start and probably don't have the equipment to do so. But let me tell you something. There is an app that will allow you to create your podcast and actually give you the tools that you need to make it. It's called Anchor. It's free to use and you can download it right to your phone or your computer. And Anchor will also help you distribute your podcast so it can be heard on places like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listen- listenership and it's every- and has everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So if you're looking to use your voice to speak to something that you are passionate about or something that makes your heart sing, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And you can download Anchor from wherever apps are sold. Hello, welcome to the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with me, Stephanie Hardy. I'm the creator and host of this podcast. And if this is your first time listening, welcome to my world. And if this isn't your first time listening, welcome back. I know it's been a minute since I posted um, the last episode, probably about two weeks. I took a break, um, but I am glad to be back now. And I'm going to share a lot of cool things that have happened um, to me and this podcast in the last couple of days um, near the end of the show. So what we're going to start with, I'm going to start with news and gossip ish, you know, all of that's all of what's going on in the wrestling world right about now. Um, and then I'm going to tell a special wrestling fan story time um, with my experience with Byron Saxton and how I feel like he's basically becoming the new commentary star since this crisis has begun. Um, and I'm also going to discuss all the all the happenings this week in wrestling in terms of WWE from Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. So sit back and relax and welcome to Hardy Wrestling with me, your girl, Stephanie Hardy. Okay, so I want to start off this news and gossip-ish segment by mentioning what's going on here in the United States in terms of the crisis. There are a couple of states that are opening up slowly but surely, um, but there had been some rumors that WWE was seeking to possibly do a live event with um, an audience in June. Um, but what I would just say is that I hope everyone a part of the wrestling fan community is doing whatever they can, um, to keep themselves safe and to keep their family safe during this crazy time. And ultimately it is your decision to do whatever it is that you feel like you can do. But I just want everyone, you know, to just stay safe out there and to just, you know, be mindful of everything that's happening. And until, you know, something, you know, pretty finite is done about it just do whatever you can to dodge this thing okay all right so we're gonna start the news and gossip segment with the news that curtis axel was released by wwe this past week so in the midst of everything that's been going on with everyone with a with a whole list of people who got gotten released due to the crisis Curtis Axel was released this past week. Um, He was signed to WWE in 2007 and wrestled at the Developmental Territory Florida Championship Wrestling, or FCW, as we affectionately call it. Um, He was a one-time FCW Florida Heavyweight Champion and a four-time FCW Tag Team Champion. Um, He moved to NXT under the name Michael McGillicuddy, but then he debuted on the main roster with the Nexus group. And y'all remember the Nexus and how they debuted um, with Wade Barrett and Justin Gabriel and I believe Ezekiel Jackson and um, David Otunga and of course Curtis. And they debuted and proceeded to destroy a whole, the entire set, beat everybody up, including the commentators and the camera people and everything. And it was just really awful. But, um... He also won the tag team championships with David Otunga and also with Bo Dallas as the B team. And y'all remember that cute little B team chant they had B team, B team, go, go, go. I thought it was cute. But also in 2013, he reignited his career by pairing with Paul Heyman and becoming a Paul Heyman guy. And he renamed himself Curtis Axel 
to um, pay tribute to his late Hall of Fame dad, Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning, and his grandfather, Larry the Axe Hennig. Um, and he also won the Intercontinental title during this time. Now, his cuts, may, now him being cut might have to do with the crisis, but either way, we wish him the best of luck. And hopefully, um, if he's not just furloughed or if he, you know, decides that this is really it for him, you know, in terms of wrestling with the WWE, I'm pretty sure he'll go elsewhere, you know, and fly further, whether it be AEW, New Japan, or wherever he chooses to go. So he'll be okay. Also in the news, we had a social media scandal involving the, Vel- the Velveteen Dream. And he got caught up like Usher. So, on Instagram, Velveteen Dream opened up his DMs for a certain amount of time for people, you know, to message him whatever it is they wanted to message him. And I guess during this time, there was an alleged underage person who, um, who basically, like, accused him of sending them inappropriate photos. Now, of course, later he, he came out and said that he was hacked and basically, you know, stated that a third party was going to be looking into it and he did tweet about it he basically said be assured i did not communicate inappropriately with anyone a private photo of mine was shared without my consent or knowledge and i'm working with a third party to look into this matter now i would seriously hope that nothing major happened in this situation simply because of the fact that he has so much potential to be a star if he were to ever go to the main roster or if he were to stay in NXT. And also right now he's in line to go after the NXT championship against Adam Cole this Wednesday. So it seems like he hasn't been necessarily taken off television or being punished for this specific thing. So we're going to wish him the best in that and hope he can just bring his fabulousness, you know, on Wednesday. Also in the news, we have Becky Lynch making a cameo in the um, popular Showtime TV show Billions. Now, she is going to premiere she is going to appear on the season 5 premiere of the show which comes on tonight and it features actors Damian Lewis, Paul Giamatti, Maggie Siff and Condola Rashad. And it's a cameo, so basically she'll be playing herself within it. And basically one of the creators of the show, I believe, was a fan of Becky Lynch and was at an interview wearing the Becky Lynch t-shirt with her mugshot on it. Y'all remember when she got arrested? with um charlotte and ronda rousey during last um re- last year's wrestlemania time so he was wearing that t-shirt so now she's sort of branching out into the acting thing more which i find is really great because when it comes to acting there aren't a lot of you know female wrestlers who've branched off into acting you know and done it you know in a crossover kind of way in a big mainstream type of way so if Becky is definitely going to do it it'll be great she also mentioned in an interview with TMZ Sports um yesterday that Dwayne Rock Johnson has been giving her advice and guiding her and she, and she basically said that he has been giving um really great advice and I think they're all because they've been there and they're real and they're ready to look after the next generation and she also said that John Cena has been giving her some notes as well so if she is so because of all of her charisma and all of her popularity she's crossing over to mainstream media and I cannot be prouder of her for it because she deserves it all and you know she's also on cereal boxes because she's definitely on post cereal boxes and she's on the box for the ice cream bars which I did by today. So, <laughs> and then you can look on on my social media to see, you know, the picture of me, you know, sort of in my house, you know, looking at the ice cream bars. So it's a big moment for her. So I'm proud of Becky Lynch. Yay, Becky. All right. And then also in the news, we have um, Kane Velasquez, who was also released from WWE. So the former two-time UFC heavyweight champion was let go this past week along with all the other cuts they had made and what's so weird about his release is the fact that he had made a huge splash after Brock Lesnar won the WWE title back on the premiere episode of Smackdown on Fox last October um, versus Kofi Kingston and I would also like to note that Kofi Kingston hasn't had another title shot since that happened which I think kind of sucks, but that's that. But that has nothing to do really with the story. But K 
Kane was booked to look like a huge, like a major credible threat to Lesnar as someone who defeated him in the MMA world and basically made him bleed and left a scar on his face and all that other stuff. But then Brock and Kane only had one match and and it was at Crown Jewel and it was basically critically panned. Everybody hated that match and it was and I know I watched that match and it wasn't necessarily one of the best ones they had on that card. Um and then he was injured um he had a knee injury I believe and we hadn't really seen him on TV since and then of course you know with Brock Lesnar he went on to face Drew McIntyre and then he lost at WrestleMania um so it felt like it was kind of a waste because they brought him up there and it seemed like he didn't have that much ability in terms of wrestling of course he had ability in MMA but in term but in terms of being an MMA star, you have to be able to athletically transition and successfully transition into the professional wrestling landscape. And it didn't seem like his ability really matched up with it just yet. And it's a shame that he's gone now, but I mean, I mean, what are you going to do? So I wish him the best in his um, endeavors. And also, unfortunately, one of our, one of my favorite wrestlers is also injured and his and this is Jimmy Uso of the Usos tag team and he's expected to miss six to nine months after suffering a knee injury in the triple threat ladder match um at Wrestlemania for the Smackdown tag team championships and they haven't really been on TV lately and it kind of sucks because you know he bounced back him and his brother bounced back from so much personal you know, adversity in terms of, you know, getting in trouble with the law and stuff in order to, you know, make their dreams come true and be the one of the greatest tag teams of the modern era, in my personal opinion. And now he's injured, so they're not going to be on TV for a while. And that just, oh, it sucks because I really like them. So no more Uso Penitentiary for a while. So that's it for your news and gossip. And now we're going to go to wrestling fan story time. And I'm and in wrestling fan story time, I'm going to give my just due to Byron Sexton. Stay tuned. All right. So with this um, segment of wrestling fan story time, I'm going to shine a light on someone who has personally um, made me incredibly happy as a wrestling fan and someone who I think doesn't really get that much just do at all um, in terms of being a great a good or even a great commentator in terms of this modern era and that's Byron Saxton Um, I know that of course you know when before the crisis happened he was kind of known as a dude that a lot of people would just tell to shut up because he was always, you know, saying something goofy or, you know, expressing his opinion that wasn't necessarily, you know, popular or whatever. Because, I mean, Corey Graves has basically made a career out of it because he, he'll always be like, shut up, Saxton, you know, when they were together. And <laughs> and there were always like a couple of, you know, different WWE media things where they would show him you know, sort of just being, you know, poo-pooed off. Because I'll never forget the time Nia Jax was on an episode of WWE Ride Along on the network. And um, it seemed like he was trying to ask her out. And she was basically joking with him and making it seem like there was no way in the world, you know, he, she would never, she would ever give him a chance. They would sort of portray him as this unlucky, unplucky dude. And, you know, a part of me would wonder in the back of my mind, like, is this guy really as goofy or as you know lame as they try to make him seem or is there something else to him you know that they just you know that they're just kind of hiding and I feel like a lot of the time since he sits next to so many you know great people in terms of commentary like Tom Phillips like um Jerry the King Lawler to a certain degree and like Corey Graves you know and like Michael Cole when they have such strong personalities Um, A lot of his stuff just doesn't really get a chance to really show that much. And I feel like since this crisis has happened and since they've been doing the shows, the live shows without the audience, I've talked about before how you can hear more of the dialogue. and You can actually um, focus more on what's being said, not even just from the commentators, but also just from the wrestlers and the referees. But... 
I feel like since this crisis has happened and since we can hear the commentators more um, than we normally do, Byron has really risen to the occasion and shown himself to be an incredibly capable commentator. And there were a couple of moments where I believe it was, I believe it was 316 day where he was holding up all kinds of signs, you know, kind of rating um, Stone Cold Steve Austin's um, sayings that he was doing in the ring because he was drinking beer and saying all the things you should be able to do on 316 day, you know, how you can flip off your boss and drink, how you know, a whole lot of beer and all this other stuff. And Byron was just rating him for everything and he was just giving his opinion and it was just so funny. Now, of course, you know, since this was a silly segment and this is a Stone Cold Steve Austin segment, Byron had to get stunned. But, you know, it was okay because him... And Stone Cold Steve Austin really bounced off of each other really well. And I enjoyed that segment very much so. And even with how he commentates sometimes occasionally on NXT um, and even on Raw, like you can hear more of his opinions, you know, and some of his opinions are just very strong and very intelligent. Like, and it's just, and I feel like we really haven't been noticing it for real that much. And he just deserves his recognition. And I will also note that one incredible moment that he had was during the Kofi Mania victory moment at WrestleMania last year. He carried he carried that commentary for like the longest for for when after Kofi won his match, he carried that commentary and told that story and drove that emotion home harder than any other person at that table and you can quote me on it you know we can probably debate about it on social media but um if you watch the Kofi mania moment back where Kofi won like and listen to all, every, all the beautiful things that Byron was saying in terms of the emotion and all that other saying and all the other stuff like Byron really drove it home and I feel like he just did he just doesn't get enough credit at all for how much he added to that moment for me I was on the floor crying (laughs) but you know I was on the floor crying in my boyfriend's lap crying but at the same point right you know listening to his voice and then watching the Kofi Mania moment as many times as I've watched it back over and over again because I'm obsessed with that moment and it was that's the happiest I'd ever been with anything um in Wrestlemania ever but um he really drove that home and I appreciated that And he just deserves all the credit, you know, and even on NXT this past Wednesday where he was the host of The Bro Show with Matt Riddle and his new tag team partner, Timothy Thatcher, to take the place of Pete Dunne. Like he real a lot of his silliness, you know, kind of shows through showed through this past Wednesday. And I'm going to discuss that um, a little bit more as well. But he was really funny. He was really a good part of that um, show on Wednesday. And I'm going to end this segment by telling the story of how I actually met him. You know, if you follow me, if you follow the podcast page on Instagram, which is at Hardy Wrestling Podcast, I posted a picture of me and him. And I've met him and talked to him like two times at a SmackDown here in Birmingham. But the first time I met him, I was with my dad and my sister. And I met him and I had him autograph my belt and everything. And it was really cool. He was so nice and he was so, you know, sweet and loving, you know. But what was so funny was I was doing all the talking and my sister is a very low key person. Um, Shout out to Jackie. Um, she's very low key type of person and she's not really, you know, that much of an extrovert like I am. So she was just kind of like standing off to the side, like, wow, this is really him. And he was making fun of my sister for being posed with kind of like her finger over her mouth. And, (laughs) and he just kept making fun of her, you know, over like just making her laugh and everything, making us laugh. And it was such a precious moment, you know, that we'll hold dear. And then, and it was so funny because it didn't even end, you know, after he left and he quit taking pictures with us and went to take pictures with the other fans he went to his um rental car you know at the parking lot you know and we're walking away after all the superstars have left at this point we're walking down the sidewalk of the bjcc um arena and he drives up like 
as we're walking up the sidewalk and drives up and he does the hand um covering thing at my sister and me and my dad and my sister just kept laughing the whole time because we just couldn't believe that was happening like I really appreciate moments like that because it seems like Byron is the type of person who makes fans you know feel good you know whether the show is on or whether the show is off and I really appreciated that and I hope that he has a flourishing career you know as a commentator you know as a you know personality with a microphone until of course you know he decides you know he wants to do something else or retire or whatever I hope he stays at WWE forever but even if he doesn't it'll still be okay <laughs> and um also if you're listening to the show and if you know any stories that you might have with Byron Saxon feel free to leave it you know on my pictures or you know message me on Twitter or something or message me on Facebook and tell me you know if you have any stories with him or if he's you know done anything in commentary um before the crisis or even during the crisis that's made you laugh or you know giggle or something like that so that's the end of this segment and now we're going to go to this week in wrestling All right, so we're going to talk about what happened on Raw, and we're going to start with the girls. Okay, so with the girls, you had a match between Asuka, Nia Jax, and Shayna Baszler. Now, last, now I know a few, two weeks ago, Nia Jax had a match with Kyrie Sane, and of course she beat her because she's being booked to kind of go on a tear since she's returned, which is good, but... Nia Jax was also being ribbed on social media because there was a point where they post WWE posted a clip where she threw Kyrie saying while Kyrie was screaming, I'm not set, I'm not set. And she threw Kyrie saying and her head hit the second turnbuckle, I think. And that was literally like the scariest thing I had ever seen. And when I first saw it, I had no clue, you know, if it was supposed to be like that or not. But I didn't know that she was saying I'm not set until I saw it on Twitter and somebody commented it. And I was like, "Ooh," you know, I really hope that Nia gets it together because she can't just keep hitting these girls any kind of way, you know, and expect it not to get, you know, talked about or expecting not to have any consequences. Because she did, she is the woman who broke Becky Lynch's nose, so let's not forget that. Um, it turned her into a star, but then again, it kept her from wrestling at Survivor Series that year. But yeah, Nia needs to get it together. Anyway, Asuka um, mentioned about how two years ago she tapped out Nia Jackson, and Nia interrupted. And then Shayna decided to go after Asuka after she made her entrance, and she was beating her outside of the ring. Then Shayna tossed Asuka into some ladders, but then Nia threw Shayna into the barricade and then Shayna got thrown into a ladder by Oscar but then Naya thumped Oscar down to the floor in another unsafe kind of looking way but you know we're just gonna pray for her and <laughs> Naya threw the ladder into the ring and then ran into Baszler and Oscar with it and then lifted uh, lifted it up over her head and threw it backwards and Byron who I mentioned before is getting a lot bolder in his commentary and his opinions say that he chooses Naya to basically win the women's money in the bank match um next Sunday so there was that then there was also um how Lana wanted to come out with Bobby Lashley to his match with Denzel Desjardins but Bobby Lashley told her not to because she distracts him because and he fixed it up to say oh you distract me because you're so beautiful and all this other stuff but then she decided to stay back there but I know that was his way of saying you know I really don't want you out there I need to focus and all that other stuff but that's another thing that's going on Lana and Bobby Lashley might be about to break up but also um something else involving the women that I thought was cool was that Within the match between Bobby Lashley and Dizel Desjardins, you had Aja Smith, who is the first black woman referee in WWE, um, basically officiating the match. So I thought that was amazing. So I'm just like, OK, so she's doing it. So, you know, she's refing on TV. So this is great. Go Aja. Go Aja. Go Aja. And then also with the women, you had... Um, Liv Morgan versus Ruby Riot again 
And it started with the traditional lockup, but then Ruby was beating Liv into the corner and she tried to kick her, but Ruby Riot moved out of the way. And then Liv got hit by the Riot kick to a near fall after Liv missed, missed her corner slam. And something that Ruby Riot kept trying to tell um, Liv Morgan was like, you need to know your place and learn your place and all this other stuff. And then Riot kept kicking Liv down and Liv hit Ruby with the oblivion off the middle ropes again, which is a really cool move. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you look at it because it's really dangerous looking. And she beat her, hopefully for the final time. And then after after they did the replay, Byron came to the ring here again and um, did an interview with Liv and asked her if this if this is the start of a new chapter. And Liv said, I feel like a lot of people my age figuring out where I am, but I'm confident that I will figure it out. So that was cool. And then Nia Jax had a promo with Charlie Caruso. And Charlie tried to ask her, you know, what's up you know why are you you know being so ruthless and then Naya was like my actions what can you do about my actions nothing what can Oscar do about my actions nothing what can anyone do about my actions and then she screamed out nothing and it was just so random because it's just I just feel like it's so scary for her to just talk normal and then just scream out of nowhere like ma'am like it, it's so scary like it it's so scary um <laughs> so Zelina Vega was also a presence throughout the show and I'm going to talk about that more so in the beginning but she really did kind of get in Charlie's face and basically tell her that she'll never ask Andrade another question and she was basically like destroying her, Charlie's professionalism and all of that but then Charlie ran into Angel Garza Mm -hmm. and told her you know you are very professional and hopefully sometime and hopefully sometime in the near future we could get better acquainted and he gave and he gave her a rose and it was like ooh, I feel like I'm getting Angel Garza and Charlie's you know kind of flirtatious love affair is almost giving me what The Rock and Lillian Garcia couldn't give me in the like in the late 90s early 2000s but I'm here for it because I love me a good love story. So <laughs> um, they also showed a recap of Becky Lynch winning the Raw and SmackDown Women's Championship at WrestleMania last year, which I think is cool. But at the same time, they've showed it to us like a whole lot. So I'm not necessarily mad about it. It was just something that I guess just happened. So now to the men, Samoa Joe was back on commentary because as you know, he did get injured from doing a WWE commercial, but now he's back on commentary. And I love it because hearing him is like a breath of fresh air um with tom phillips and byron saxon as opposed to jerry the king lawler but you know i'm not gonna go into that today so the show started with mvp's vip lounge talk show with three of the money in the bank participants for the men's match ray mysterio alistair black and apollo cruz and he stated that everyone wants to know what it means to become Mr. Money in the Bank. But MVP kept interrupting and talking for them. So he really wasn't letting his guests talk. Um, but Apollo Crews um, wanted to start talking. But then he got interrupted by Zelina Vega and said, and she basically said, and no one wants to see them in the Money in the Bank match. But she claimed that um, everybody wants to see what I call... Los Ingobernables de Estados Unidos, who are basically Andrade, Angel, and Austin Theory. And she said that the three participants were the future, but you represent a bleak one. And then they kicked down the MV, they kicked down the VIP set. And Rey Mysterio basically got in Zelina's face and said, you expect us to give up our spots? And then you came out here to pick a fight. And then a brawl ensued and basically Ray Alster and Apollo was, was able to stand tall while Los Ingobernables got thrown out of the ring. So this led to a six-man tag um, between Angel Garza, between Angel Garza, Austin Theory, Andrade, and Apollo Cruz, Ray, and Alistair Black. And let me just say that I think it's absolutely funny to see Zelina Vega talk all so much trash to Alistair Black, knowing full well in real life they're like married. So it's funny. But anyway, Garza and Black started the match. 
Alistair Black was twisting Garza's leg as Garza tried to fight out unsuccessfully. Angel was kicking Alistair Black's leg, but then he kept, but then he got kicked and then taken down into an arm lock. And then Garza kept fighting back. He fought back to a near fall. And then Alistair Black hit a leg sweep into a submission on Garza. Then Apollo Crews and Austin Theory got tagged in. And Crews performed one of the best matches I've seen him perform in a long time this night. He did really good. Um, he was showing out with his significant cruiserweight flips. And then he tagged in Ray. Ray put on the offense, but then got triple teamed by Andrade, um, by Andrade and the rest of his team. And Ray finally fought back with the her Karana into a 619 attempt on Andrade. Theory and Garza um, kept moving El Idolo out of the way, but he kept but then they met backflip dives from Alistair Black and Apollo Cruz. And basically, they proceeded to also gang up on Alistair Black in the corner. And Austin Theory hit a suplex on Alistair Black to a near fall. Then Austin Theory put a cross face on Alistair Black until Alistair Black was able to break it. But then Austin Theory threw Alistair Black into a corner to a near fall. Garza and Andrade kept attacking, you know, every member of the team. And then Austin Theory put Alistair Black in another headlock until Alistair Black tried to fight out of it. But Austin Theory kept locking his knee into Alistair Black's leg, which I think was a very smart move. Then Alistair Black was fight was fighting back to a near fall. Austin Theory got kicked by Alistair Black looking for a tag, but then um, Alistair Black tagged Ray, and he comes and he comes in with all kinds of fire on Andrade to a near fall. He hit a hurricanrana on Andrade and then slammed Angel. Angel snatched off his pants, of course, and slid Ray out of the ring. And then at this point, all of Ray's partners have been beat up and incapacitated. So Austin Theory tossed Ray. He tossed Ray, and then Andrade stomped Ray into the corner. Then Andrade prepped the three amigos, but then Ray kicked him so he couldn't finish it. And then Ray hit a spike DDT, and it was really cool. And then Cruz and Theory get tagged in, and then Cruz pops off to a near fall. And then Theory hit knee, hit a knee drop to a near fall on Cruz, but then a whole lot of chaos ensues, and then they all just fight each other. And then um, Andrade hit an elbow on Apollo Cruz to a near fall, but then Cruz hit a power bomb and pinned Andrade for the win. So, but this wasn't the end of their storyline at all. So, along with that, um, during the show, they were celebrating Triple H's 25th anniversary with the company. And of course, they did the top 10 moments um, of Triple H's career. And Number 10 was March 1998 when DX formed with Billy Gunn, Road Dog, Jesse James, China, rest in peace, and X-Pac. And number nine was in March 2015 when Triple H um, beat Sting at WrestleMania with DX and the NWO. And I really don't think that Sting should have lost that match, but, you know, WWE has to go over WCW no matter what. So then it went back to Andrade and Zelina arguing backstage um, she basically said that the part that, um, his other group members, Angel and Austin let him down. And then he put his championship on the line against Cruz and Rey Mysterio at any time. But then Apollo Cruz was feeling really confident that night, but then Andrade slapped him, but then Cruz slapped him back super hard to the point to where my mom let out like a really bad word. And it was really funny. Um, <laughs> and then Zelina made the title match between Cruz and Andrade tonight so that was cool and then they showed a montage of Seth and Drew um for their WWE championship match at Money in the Bank then they showed two more Triple H um 25 moments number eight was August 1999 which was the very first Smackdown main event versus The Rock for the WWE slash probably WWF championship and he beat The Rock with the assist to real life best friend Shawn Michaels pre-Jesus and then number seven was July 2000 when Triple H got caught in a compromising position with Trish Stratus backstage by Stephanie McMahon, the ultimate drama queen. Thank God for the women's evolution. If you've seen that moment, then you know exactly what I mean. Then, um, like I mentioned before, Bobby Lashley had his match with Denzel Desjardins. And as you can tell, um, Denzel was basically kind of playing the role of a jobber. So Bobby Lashley basically just ran through him and beat him. Um, and gave him a suplex um, 
a suplex, a DDT, and a choke slam into a spear in order to win the match. So there's that. And then they also showed a commercial for that new um, 2K Battlegrounds video game that everybody's been talking trash about on Twitter, which because they basically said it's basically another WWE All Stars, and I can totally see that. But my problem with the commercial was the fact that they showed Charlotte going over Becky. And I thought that was really stupid because I'm just sitting here like, look, Charlotte Flair may be Charlotte Flair, but Becky is like your golden goose all all over all your merchandise. So why would you have Charlotte go over Becky in a video game commercial? But whatever. Um, Then they showed another Triple H moment, which was number six, which was in June 1997 um, in the King of the Ring finals versus Mankind. And he won with the assist to China. And they mentioned basically how Money in the Bank was happening, um, how it's happening this coming Sunday and advertised the matches, which is Seth versus Drew for the win for the WWE Championship, Bray Wyatt versus Braun Strowman for the Universal Championship, Bailey versus Tamina for the SmackDown Women's Championship. And of course, the women and men's Money in the Bank matches, which I found out this past Friday, are going to be happening at the same time because they're going to have to climb the corporate ladder. <clears throat> And they're going to be fighting throughout all of WWE Global Headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut, and fighting their way up to the top floor so they can get in the ring, climb the ladder, and get the briefcase. And this is all going to be going on at the same time. It sounds like a train wreck, but hopefully it won't be. <laughs> so um, after that point, the Viking Raiders um, wanted to challenge the Street Profits. And they said that they won the tag team titles, that the Street Profits won the tag team titles after they relinquished them. Um, and basically said, you've never beaten us. Um, you've only reached to the top and we're not around. The world may call you champions, but as long as we're around, you'll only be second best. We want the smoke. So I'm glad the Viking Raiders have gotten this serious thing back going on because at first they did a carpool karaoke and it wasn't cute at all. As someone who lives for karaoke, because I love to sing, that that carpool karaoke moment was just not cute. But anyway... Um, Triple H, they showed another Triple H 25 moment, which was number five, um, that happened in November of 2019, where him and Shawn Michaels led the charge with NXT's invasion of Raw and SmackDown for brand supremacy during Survivor Series time, which was epic because they beat everybody and it was cool. And then they had a match with Akira Tozawa versus Jinder Mahal, who has now returned um, after a long hiatus. Um, they announced Jinder Mahal as a former WWE champion. And Jinder Mahal basically beat up on Tozawa in and out of the ring. And then he hit the Coloss for the win. And I'm just wondering, you know, where has he been all this time? But, you know, he's back. So there we go. And Triple H moment number four was in June 2006 when Triple H and Shawn Michaels dressed up as Vince and Shane McMahon and parodied the crap out of them. It was so funny. Um, And then we had the match with Andrade versus Apollo Crews for the United States Championship. They were mentioned now on commentary they were definitely painting a picture um of Apollo Crews and how everyone talked about his potential in the WWE but how he has yet to really capitalize off of it and how he's had multiple false starts since he's been on the main roster, you know, with the Titus Worldwide thing and him just, you know, wrestling in nothing matches or just being jobbed out to people. So, they did a lock up into the corner. Cruz and Cruz locked up Andre's arm, but Andrade locked in the legs and locked in the legs, but Apollo Cruz wiggled out into a headlock. They hit Andrade was Andrade and Apollo were hitting woo chops onto each other and well basically Ric Flair chops onto each other. And Apollo hit a drop kick and left Andrade in the like and left and Andrade left the ring rather, but Apollo Cruz rolled Andrade back inside. Andrade beat him with stomps and kicks, but he was and then Andrade just kept punishing him with knee to with a knee to the face in the corner. Andrade fell outside after missing a knee strike, and then Cruz tweaked his knee from a backflip outside of the ring. And then Andrade took advantage of it and he kept attacking Apollo Cruz's leg. And then he hit a single leg crab onto Apollo. 
and he kept up stomping on Apollo's knee and it was just really horrible to look at like he just you know he just kept attacking him and then Apollo Crews moved out of the way from Andrade's double knee into the corner move and then Apollo Crews fought back in a major way he did an overhead belly to belly but then Andrade kicked Apollo Crews but then Andrade but then Apollo Crews kicked him back and then um Apollo Crews hit a standing moonsault to a near fall, but then Andrade hit a drop toe hole to a near fall as well. So they were basically on each other this entire match. But here's where it got really sad. Um, Apollo Crews stayed in the match somehow, and Andrade was kicking Apollo Crews' injured knee. And then Andrade hit a DDT, but Apollo Crews still kicked out. Then uh, then Apollo Crews almost got him with major offense, you know, defend like fighting back but then Apollo Cruz climbed to the top rope but then Andrade caught him to try to hit a superplex but then Apollo Cruz came down on his bad knee and the referee had to stop the match which is where it got really sad and then Andrade basically retained the title because of it and it was so sad because Apollo Cruz was really trying but then he was crying afterward and then they found him backstage crying and it was just and he was walking away on crutches and it was so sad then we had a Triple H moment, um, which was number three, um, which was February 2003, which is the debut of Evolution, which I believe is our modern day Four Horsemen with Randy Orton, Batista, Ric Flair, and Triple H. So then the Street Profits responded to the Viking Raiders challenge and said, so they say we're second best. And they made fun of their carpool karaoke. And they basically said they were free next week. So the Viking Raiders and the Street Profits are going to go after each other for the tag team titles. Yay! Then Ricochet and Cedric Alexander in matching gear went went on a went in a tag team match with Everrise from NXT as Chase Parker and Matt Martell. Rick and Cedric basically took advantage until Rick got distracted by Everrise to a near fall. Um, there was a headlock with Ricochet's arm, and then he slammed, and then he slammed slammed it into the corner with to a near fall and then Cedric and Chase got tagged in and then Cedric got aggressive with the tornado DDT and Ricochet backflipped onto Parker for to a near fall and then Ricochet and Cedric hit a face first DDT stomp combo to win the entire match then MVP came on the screen and said I got a keen eye for talent Shane Thorne and Brendan Fink and then they basically said that Ricochet and Cedric's win last week was a fluke and a rematch could be box office platinum and box office balling. So yeah. Then they showed the number two moment for Triple H's 25th anniversary, which was April 1998, when Triple H and DX invaded WCW in Norfolk. So that was funny. And like I said, they showed Apollo Crews um with an iced knee and crutches, and he cried with nothing to say, and Charlie was like, I'm so sorry. And then Triple H, Triple H's number one moment was in May 2001, where he tore his quad and he was injured for a while. And he came back triumphantly in January of 2002 um, to a thunderous crowd in Madison Square Garden. Then to end the match, we had the WWE Championship contract signing with Jerry Lawler moderating. Jerry Lawler broke down the corporate ladder matches um, and with the object of the matches and he introduces Seth and then Seth comes out in a suit and then he introduces Drew who came out um in jeans and a leather jacket and he looked kind of yummy in that and then they were basically in the middle of the ring you know how they like to do sit at the table and talk trash at each other during a contract signing these don't ever go well so Drew told Jerry the King Lawler you know how these things tend to go and I think it's gonna go that way so you need to skedaddle so he left and Drew signed the contract and said that Seth was the one that jumped him. And then he said, at time's ticking. And then Seth said, you think I want this? I don't want to do this. I have to do this. This isn't about me or you. You're going to be a good champion one day. You're honorable, but you're not a leader. I'm a leader and people have followed me. The WWE Universe needs someone to guide them. I can be a guide and light in that darkness. I suffered for that title. I don't want you to suffer the way I did. That's my burden to carry, not yours. I don't want to be the one to crush your dream, but it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. And I will lead you too. But then Drew said, um, thank you, Seth. 
that was a really passionate, enlightening speech. Things are super clear to me. It's clear that you are completely full of ish. But he didn't say ish. They literally had him say the S word on TV. And that still freaks me out to this day. I know I'm 26 years old, but it still freaks me out. It's never Seth's fault that fans turn on you. He basically, he was basically saying, so Seth never takes any responsibility for any of the bad stuff that happens to him. And he said, I will not let you win this championship under any circumstances. And he told him, number one, shut your mouth and stop talking. No one wants to hear you talk. And he said, you get your foot stuck in there and your head stuck in your, in your butt, but he didn't say butt. And number two, go for the, and he's told, he told him to go for the throat since you jumped me. And then Seth said, the bigger picture will will be very clear and you'll be better off for it. Have faith. And he, and he told him to have faith in. But then Drew bounced off of Seth's, bounced Seth's head off the table and gave him a Glasgow, a Glasgow kiss. But before he can hit the Claymore kick, Murphy beat him up from behind. And then Seth threw Murphy in the middle of the Claymore kick that he was that Drew meant for Seth. And then Drew was yelling at him, says, is this your one follower? Is this the only person that's going to follow you now? And then the, then, then the show went off. So Raw was pretty heated. And it was definitely a really stacked show. And it was really good. So um, now we're going to go into NXT. Alright, so this week with NXT, a whole lot went on. Um, so, like I said, we're going to start with the girls. The first women's match was Candice LeRae with Johnny Gargano versus K- Casey Catanzaro. And this is really, I believe, probably the second or maybe the first match we've seen with Candice LeRae debuting her new evil character. Instead of a pint-sized pixie, she's now pint-sized poison, and she's dyed her hair purple, and she's wearing darker makeup, and her outfit is cute, and her and Johnny Gargano are giving me Joker Harley Quinn vibes, and it's all weird. But anyway, um, <laughs> my boyfriend basically said that Johnny was a mixture of um, Maria Canellas and Montez Ford, um, and that was really funny because he was basically rooting for Candace the entire time, which is what you're supposed to do when you're a good husband. Um, Larray was being more aggressive in her offense than she has been in a while. Casey Kanzara got in some offense, but then Candace hit the wicked stepsister in order to win and basically kill K- Casey Kanzaro. But then she went back to the ring and hit the Gargano escape on Casey to the delight of Johnny. And then she kissed him on the cheek. So they're running roughshod and being evil together. Then, in terms of another women's match, we had Mia Yim versus NXT Women's Champion Charlotte Flair. Woo! Mia had her first match in NXT against Charlotte Flair during Charlotte's first run as NXT Women's Champion six years ago. So, this is kind of like a full circle moment. Um, the match started with a lock up to the ring corner, and then there was a lot of knee to stomach going on, and then Flair did the flare chop, did the flare chop on Mia. And then Mia Yim ducked Charlotte Fair's big boot that she always hits. And then she hit a bunch of kicks to a near fall. Mia Yim was actually did the Andrade rope catch during a point. Like Charlotte tried to throw her and then Mia Yim was like, boom, but she didn't do the tranquilo pose, but she caught herself and it was just like, you knew exactly where that was from. So then Charlotte Flair um, threw Mia out of the ring and then Mia got stomped on. But then Mia basically did a tarantula and on charlotte flair and they were trading punches and then hit and then she hit flair with the soul food kick to a near fall then charlotte flair put mia in a crab but then met a boot to the face to a near fall and then charlotte flair tried for the figure eight but mia wiggled out of it into a cover but then flair hit another figure eight to win the match and it was so funny because mia yim showed such a great effort and what, and then Io Shirai came out to Charlotte to challenge Charlotte Flair for the NXT Women's Title next week. And something I find really funny is there are a couple people on social media, and I won't name names, who basically make it seem like Mia Yim is not a, that good of a wrestler, but she really did show a whole lot of like she just did really good Wednesday. Screw anyone else who doesn't think so. Anyway, um. 
Then next week, they de- they announced the debut of Killer Cross and Scarlet Bordeaux. And then they showed a clip of Casey Canzaro being tended to backstage. And she basically said that Candace hurt her neck and she was being supported by her best friend, um, Caden Carter, a.k.a. Lacey Lane. But then Cand- Candace LeRae came back there and said, from now on, this is a new NXT and get used to it. So that's basically all that happened with the women. So now we're going to st- go to the beginning of the show. So they did a recap of everything that's happened in the NXT Cruiserweight Championship Tournament between Groups A and Groups B. And Mauro Ronaldo and Beth Phoenix are commentating um, and they're back. So they started with a match from Group B, which was Isaiah Swerve Scott versus El Hijo del Fantasma. Um, it started with the lockup, as a lot of these matches tended to do this week. Um, <laughs> and there was there are a lot of impressive spots in this match so i'm just going to list a couple of them um there was an inside cradle to a near fall but then swerve hit an impressive hurricanrana from the middle rope with a near fall then eho hit a frankensteiner to a near fall which was really cool and then isaiah won the match with a crucifix roll up and he basically stated after the match that he has all the respect in the world for eho but he refuses to be denied and this will be swerve's house so now he's one and one in the tournament Then you had Dominic Dijakovic, who did a promo and said, I need to respect the people who defined me. And Johnny just complains, but doesn't back up his words in the ring. And he challenged Johnny wrestling to a match next week. So there's a lot going on this this coming Wednesday. Please check it out. Um, And then Ijo, El Ijo del Fantasma almost got attacked by the mass mystery men in suits who've been kidnapping people, but he ran away from them. So... That happened, but then Damian Priest also had a promo where he said that running, that the running is over between him and Keith Lee. I finally get to finish what I started months ago, and you will be basking in the glory of the new North American champion. Then Matt Riddle and Timothy Thatcher came out and um, introduced the newly bro show hosted by Byron Saxon that I mentioned in Wrestling Fan Storytime earlier, and... They basically answered a lot of silly questions about each other and they were attacked by Imperium and beat up to a pulp. Fabian Eichner and Marcel Bartel, or like my boyfriend likes to say, Marcel Bartel held up the tag team titles and then left Timothy Thatcher laid out. Then Adam Cole came on and said that um, him and Velveteen Dream will have a match next week. And he said that the Velveteen Dream is an experience that no one ever wanted. And, and basically went on to say that he doesn't deserve a chance. And I'm going to show up as champion. I'm going to leave as champion. The dream will be over. And that is undisputed. Then they talked about how Finn got attacked last week and how he didn't show up. Um, so we don't, we still don't know who did that, but he's supposed to show up this week. So there's that. And then Dexter Loomis had a match versus Shane Thorne, who was supposed to be, you know, a part of the winning team with MVP and Brandon Vick, but you know, he lost. <laughs> um, Shane Thorne was co-signed by Harley Race. And they mentioned that in commentary. Um, may he rest in peace. And then Shane um, was attacked until Dexter gave was attacking until Dexter gave vicious punches and kicks. And then Thorne raked Loomis's eyes, but then Dexter hit arm triangle on Thorne as he passed out. And the referee ended the match. And something I find really cool and also very scary about um, Dexter Loomis is the fact that he has the offense of a serial killer. Um, it just seems like when he punches you. He punches you almost like if you've ever watched like a true crime documentary and they act out how the killer may have killed someone and they show how they just dramatically punch over and over again with the intent to kill. That's kind of what he looks like. And I don't mean to trigger anybody or anything like that, but literally that's just what Dexter Loomis reminds me of. He just reminds me of a serial serial killer and it's just too much. Um, (laughs) But I guess that's just the point. He's creepy. Then Keith Lee um basically said that Damian Priest bruised his larynx last week and he said you want to live in infamy so too will the beating I give you and it was just like wow um then group B was an- they had another match in the cruiserweight tournament with group B and it was Tony Nese versus Drake Maverick and something cool that I found out about Drake Maverick is the fact that he's from Birmingham England so it's just like we're both Birmingham yay except you know my Birmingham is not Birmingham but country but anyway um 
it just makes me love him more. And as you know, they're going with the story of him being released along with the list, the long list of other people. But the mystery is whether or not this release is actually scripted or is, is it scripted or is it actually real? And he's going to wrestle these last few matches and then be gone. Like it's really hard to tell. It's like the lines are definitely blurred. So Tony Nese had gotten a whole lot of offense on Drake Maverick he kept bullying him throughout the entire match and he kept using his words to hurt his feelings he said you're gonna have to do better than that and then Nice continued to beat him up in the corner and then he kicked Drake Maverick in the back saying I thought you were fighting for your life and then Drake Maverick finally punched back but then Nice hung hung Drake Maverick up by the neck and then Nice had Drake Maverick in a headlock and then he kicked back he gets kicked in the back again. And he said, are you going to cry? People love to watch you cry, basically in reference to the video he posted after he got released. And then he slapped him. But then Drake Maverick got fired up and gave a whole flurry of punches into the corner. And then he hit Tony Nese with a missile drop kick. And then Nese um, hit a suplex on Drake Maverick. But Drake Maverick um, got a near fall. And then he climbed up to the top rope and then jumped. And then he injured his arm somehow. And then Tony... Um, got stopped on the top rope when he climbed up there and then drake maverick hit a diving bulldog to get the win and now he's one and one in group in group b and he said you can call and during his interview he said you can call me the wolf of wwe because i'm not freaking leaving so if you've ever seen the wolf of wall street and you've seen leonardo DiCaprio like um and on social media and that meme saying i'm not effing leaving i'm not effing leaving that's what drake maverick is feeling right now so let him feel it um, then we had in the main event, you had Damian Priest versus Keith Lee for the NXT North American Championship. Keith, um, blocked D- Damian Priest's kicks and then he elbowed him as well. But then Damian Priest elbowed him back, but then Keith sent him over the top rope. And then Damian Priest got clothesline over the barricade and Keith lifted him and threw him. Damien over the barricade and onto the apron in a very impressive throw. It was almost like he was throwing him like a dart. Keith Lee is strong. Um, <laughs> cause he will push people and he'll throw people, and it's just wow. Um, back in the ring, Damien took advantage, but then Keith fought him off with a deadlift. But Damien Priest gave him a neck breaker to a near fall, and then there were all kinds of power moves by Keith Lee, including a corkscrew to a near fall. And then there was another clothesline to Damien Priest, but then he kicked out. Then Damian Priest tried for a choke slam, and then Keith tried um, for a choke slam as well, and then they traded punches with each other. And then Damian Priest hit the broken arrow onto Keith Lee, and then Damian Priest jumped over the top rope onto Keith and hit a cyclone kick on, onto Keith, but then Lee t- kicked out. He just wouldn't give up. And then Keith gave Damian Priest a suplex from the top rope to a near fall, and then Keith Lee kicked out of the, out of the choke slam that Damian Priest gave him. And then Damian Priest got the nightstick that he likes to get, but then Keith blocked it and he smacked him in his chest and said, I am limitless. And he gave him two spirit bombs to win and retain his title. So that's everything that happened on NXT. And now we're going to go to SmackDown. All right, so now we're at the point where we're going to talk about SmackDown. And baby, that show had the drama. And I mean the drama, Jesus. The drama. The drama. So are you ready? Okay, so (laughs) that was my weird attempt at trying to sing the song. I'm sorry. Um, (laughs) So with the women, you had the Money in the Bank qualifier match with Carmella and Mandy Rose so before this Mandy Rose had had a promo with her and Otis and they were and they both had their matches that were money in the bank qualifiers Otis was going up against Dolph Ziggler um and Mandy was really happy to have this opportunity but then she also had to address you know the elephant in the room which was you know the rift between her and Sonya Deville but she was really focused on winning the match and then she kissed Otis on the cheek and Otis was like oh yeah because he's awesome so in this match Carmella was dancing Carmella was dancing to Mandy's song and I thought that was cute um so it started with a lockup and then a takedown by Mandy then Rose was showing some way some way better athleticism and then Mandy had a chin lock on Carmella but then Sonia came out to distract her 
and basically said, you remember this time last year, I gave you my money in the bank spot. And then she kept saying, you're doing great, sweetie. I handed you the briefcase, but you still lost. And then she basically was saying in the microphone, you've gone downhill. And then she distracted Mandy further by saying, karma is a B, is a B word, B word. You know, if you want to come fight me, come on. And she was yelling at her and everything. But then Carmella took advantage of the distraction and she won the match. And now she's qualified for money in the bank. And Sonia just kept yelling at Mandy saying, I'm going to ruin your life. I've been following you for far too long. And then she basically attacked her and just kept punching her and throwing her up against the stairs, throwing her up against the barricade. And it was just really, really rough. And... She kept saying, you will never be better than me. I'm going to ruin every inch of that pretty face. I will ruin you. And then it showed Mandy. Mandy had gotten bruised on her thigh and it was bad. And then Otis being the supportive boyfriend was trying to check on her. And then Dolph actually had the audacity to ask Otis if Mandy was okay. And I literally said out loud, you don't get to ask about her. But, you know, it's the story. But still, it's just like, you do not get to ask about her after you basically tried to like insinuated you wanted to you know date her and then be a part of this stupid plan with Sonya and all that gets go somewhere and sit down um and then Tamina had a backstage promo and with Kayla and she basically said it took four women to be her at Wrestlemania and she was talking about how she's not really worried in her match against Bailey. And then Sasha interrupted and basically said, you know, I just want us to be friends, you know, and you remember how we were in Team Bad together and we could have unity again. And then she was basically just putting on a front and then she attacked Tamina with Bailey. And then Lacey came to Tamina's defense. They basically beat each other up. And there was this one funny part where Lacey was standing up there with her shoe off. And I was just like, that is the most Southern thing I've ever seen in my life. You fighting and you got on heels, but then the minute you go to fighting, you take them shoes off. And I appreciated that so much. And also with Sonya Deville, she participated in a backstage promo with Dolph Ziggler before his match. And when I tell you her voice sounded like she was like a mixture of every evil queen that's ever existed in Disney. It's like she sounded like Cruella Deville and Maleficent had a baby when she was talking. And it was just like, whoa. (laughs) <laughs> it was really like whoa and even when she was attacking mandy like um she walked back up the ramp and she grabbed her hair and she was like i'm so sick of you and i'm just gonna ruin your life and she was just going crazy and it kind of reminded me of victoria like in the 2000s like how her gimmick was like yes i've lost my mind like in this in the song I'm like yes i've lost my mind and she would always grab her hair and make a crazy face like ah you know so that's kind of what it reminded me of and it was really cool i really feel like the skies is the limit with this mandy rose sonia deville story um they're taking it and running with it and i'm proud of them so smackdown started with the men and it started with a match between daniel bryan and baron corbin and daniel bryan was talking about you know the money in the bank beforehand and of course baron corbin was running his mouth so it was a very different type of match where whereas you had a power puncher um in baron corbin versus a technical wrestling genius and i feel like a lot of people just don't say it enough daniel bryan is a technical wrestling genius so there um Corbin kept yelling at him and saying you're a failure just like your coach Drew Gulak he was like you don't have it anymore just like just like your little show Total Divas and all this other stuff he was talking trash about his wife and everything it was bad but then Brian was battling back and then Corbin attacked Brian outside of the ring and threw his shoulder into the ring post and then Corbin had his knee into Brian's head but then Brian fought back and but still got knocked down and there were two near falls between each other and Corbin um, did the running around the pole clothesline thing to a near fall. And I really hated how commentary tried to make that seem like a move. Like all he's doing is sliding out of the ring, running around the ring post and then sliding under. I mean, that takes a lot, but they make it seem like it's the most devastating move ever. And it's just not. But anyway, it's it irritates me when he does that. But then Barry Corbin irritates me, period. Um, so then the Rev this referee was really funny i need to figure out his name he got really sassy at baron corbin and corbin was had covered brian and then the referee was hitting one two three but then brian kicked out and then 
Baron Corbin was like, that wasn't slow. Like, he was just like, that was a slow count. And then the referee was like, that wasn't slow. It was two. Like, you, like, these referees are getting really sassy at these wrestlers now. And it's so cool to hear it now. And then Corbin hit um, and worked on Daniel Bryan's arm. He was trying to, you know, injure it and wail on it and everything. But then Bryan hit a suicide dive. And then he hit a drop kick on him and then kicked the hamstrings of Baron Corbin. And then he hit an ankle lock on Baron Corbin. And he stomped at his Achilles and then kicked Baron Corbin to three near falls. And then kicked, and then he kicked Corbin. But then Corbin um, hit the deep six, but then Brian kicked out of that. And then Corbin kept punching, but then Brian tried to execute a crab submission. But then Corbin got out of the ring in time. And then after getting kicked, he threw a ladder at him and then he got disqualified. So Daniel Bryan won the match. But then Daniel Bryan got back in the ring and, and locked in a yes lock on Corbin on the ladder. But then Shinsuke Nakamura and Cesaro came to Corbin's aid. And Corbin threw Daniel in a cluster of ladders near the um, baby Titan Tron. So there's that. And Braun Strowman um, gave a promo saying that the past is exactly the past. And Bright can send as many gifts as he wants to remind me of that. But then he got interrupted by Bray Wyatt and um, the Firefly Funhouse. And then Bray Wyatt told a story to the children called The Black Sheep. He said he looked a lot like Braun Strowman, but he was strong, but he was stronger than everybody else. The um, the shepherd, which in turn was Bray Wyatt, raised the black sheep and raised him well. But then the black sheep left him. And he said, why would you leave me? Then all of his animals abandoned him, and then and then there was a lien on his property. But then the shepherd found the black sheep again, but then the black sheep took what made the shepherd happy. And then Braun said, I'm done with these puppets. If you have something to say to me, come to this ring and say it. And then Bray was silent for a while, and then he said goodbye. And then the song started playing um, out, so... Then Sheamus had a match with another jobber named Leon Ruff. And Ruff got like one kick in, literally just one. And then Ruff got thrown out and got clubbed in the chest. And then he got bro kicked and covered for the win. But then Sheamus just proceeded to get in Michael Cole's face like he's just been doing the past couple of weeks. Much to the chagrin of my father, who's just getting angry about it because he just doesn't like bullies. But... <laughs> After that, they showed a clip of Jeff Hardy and they showed his April 2009 injury and how 2019 injury rather um, and how he was out for nine months. But then he announced his comeback at WWE backstage a couple months ago. So he kept saying that there was something left for him to do in the WWE. And he was glad the people and the fans actually care about him and actually drive him to succeed. So Jeff Hardy's returning to SmackDown next week. And then Seamus got in Michael Cole's face and said, so Jeff Hardy comes back next week? And then Michael was like, yes. And then he said, well, so will I. And that was it. Then the New Day had a match. The SmackDown Tag Team Champions had a match with the Forgotten Sons. And Miz and Morrison were on commentary. So there was a lockup between Big E and Steve Cutler. And then the match, there was, this match was kind of all over the place and a little bit disorganized. Um... And there was a back and forth until Kofi bounced back on Steve Cutler. And Cutler and Wesley Blake hit a backbreaker on Kofi to a near fall. But the X factor in this entire match was Jason Riker because, you know, that tag team with the Forgotten Sons, they have a third man. And the New Day hasn't had a third man in months now because Xavier Woods has been gone. Um, but Jackson attacked Biggie outside of the ring and then the Forgotten Sons won and covered Kofi. But then Miz and Morrison basically proceeded to chant, you deserve it at the New Day. And to end the show, they had the Money in the Bank qualifier for Otis and Dolph Ziggler. And Otis was Otis basically started this match hot. He came in real hot and he gave Dolph Ziggler the best shoulder tackle I've ever seen. And I was like, yeah. And then Otis hit a vertical suplex on Ziggler to a near fall. Then Otis steps into Co into Dolph Ziggler's back. And, but then Dolph bounced back. But then Otis fought him off. And then Dolph drop kicked Otis twice. And then he put a headlock on Otis. But then Otis kept fighting back with punches. And then Dolph kicked him 
but then Otis got hyped and then pushes Dolph back to the corner. And then Dolph Ziggler tried to go for his famous or finisher move, but then he got caught. And then he hit the zigzag to a near fall. And then he tried to go for the sweet chin music like he's Shawn Michaels, which he isn't. And but then Otis caught basic caught him and then moved out of the way. And then he threw Dolph Ziggler um, and hit the caterpillar for the win. So now Otis is in the money in the bank match. Yay! So you can't help but feel like he was also part of the ways defending Mandy's honor and the mind games they're playing with her and all that. So SmackDown was incredibly interesting. So now all this is leading to Money in the Bank, um, which is this coming Sunday, aka Mother's Day. So, like I said, it's going to be a stacked show. So I'm really excited for what they're going to bring this week because all the shows are go home. So it's going to be really cool. And that ends the main event session of this podcast. All right, so to wrap this show up, I have a couple of amazing announcements um, to mention. Um, As my podcast has been growing, it's grown more and more this past week, more than um, I ever imagined that it would, in the sense that I've been sort of putting myself out there to other wrestling podcasts um, in the community online. And I've gotten all kinds of positive reviews from people who've had podcasts for months at a time, if not years at a time. And it means the absolute world to me that people would actually, you know, listen to me with my now 11 episodes and actually think that I have something to contribute to the wrestling community. And that means the absolute world to me. And I thank all of those people. Y'all know who you are. Um, thank you guys so much. And um, I've been able to gain some assistance in learning how to market myself online and everything so if you see me posting about the podcast more and more on my regular um, social media outlets like Facebook Instagram and Twitter then that's why and I also want and speaking of social media I want to announce that I my podcast has an official Twitter page now if you want to follow it you know feel free to follow it the handle is at Hardy Wrestle Pod. That's at Hardy Wrestle Pod. That's at H A R D Y. This is all lowercase. Um, so it's at H A R D Y W R E S T L E P O D. And it's got the logo on it. And I'm pretty sure the logo might change at some point, but for now, the regular logo is on the Twitter page. And like I said, you can also follow me at Queen Steph Hardy on um, Twitter as well. And I'm going to be posting more clips of more audio clips of my show as well, because I'm learning how to do that on the headliner app. And there's just a lot of blessings going on. So for starters, on Saturday, I'm going to have an interview with Aussie Lucian's blogs and podcasts. Um, They have a podcast and I'm going to be interviewing with them on Saturday and I'm really excited about that um so if you do listen to other podcasts please listen to Aussie Lucian's blogs and podcasts it'll be my first time being a guest on someone else's podcast and the fact that they're all the way in Australia just makes it even cooler so uh, that's gonna be amazing and also I'm going to be for the first time ever I'm going to be co-hosting a watch party on zoom with the o-face wrestling podcast they're a group of women who um, have an amazing podcast and they have um, been really supportive of me this week and they they and I are going to be co-hosting a money in the bank zoom watch party so if you want to participate in that I will be posting the flyer and advertising it more on social media this week and it's going to be really cool. Like, I'm really excited about these opportunities to share my opinions and to share um, my passion for what I truly love. So I'm going to be sharing the link to it later on. And it's just going to be a really cool time. So with that in mind, I'm going to end this with 
um, please follow me on all social media outlets. Follow me um, on Facebook at Stephanie LaShawn Hardy. Follow me on Instagram at Queen Steph Hardy. Follow me on also follow follow the podcast page Hardy Wrestling Podcast on Instagram. And also follow me on Twitter at Queen Steph Hardy and follow at Hardy WrestlePod on Twitter as well. So until we meet again, until um, we get together again soon, have a safe week, you know, do good things, put good things into the universe for yourself. Um, Enjoy wrestling this week, you know, stay safe. And as always, you know, just love yourself and love the people around you. Until next time, this is Hardy Wrestling with Stephanie Hardy. Bye, y'all.